One of the only ways you can measure the health of a coral reef is by being underwater and having your eyes on that reef, measuring uh, the size of fish, identifying them to species, measuring the types of different corals, measuring the complexity of a reef using a visual scale. You've got to have your eyes on the reef to do that. We've you know, seen incredible advances in satellite technology and remote sensing. Some of those are being applied to coral reefs, but there are limits to those satellites. They can only sweep the you know, top bits of the ocean or get spectral reflectance coming out of the water, but they can't count fish. It doesn't count live coral cover, and you certainly can't get at some of the more complex um, communities or food webs that are really critical to understanding the health of your coral reef. You just heard Emily Darling. She's a marine biologist and the director of coral reef at the Wildlife Conservation Society. We hear a lot about how satellite imagery is paving the way towards monitoring change on Earth. That's quite useful, except when what you're looking for is underwater. So I wanted to chat with Emily, who you just heard, as well as Kim Fisher, who also works at the Wildlife Conservation Society as a spatial analyst, how they've both been working on a platform called Mermaid, which is helping scientists working around coral reef conservation by letting them aggregate their measurements together. As Emily mentioned, currently to gather any data around coral reef, we need to send people with boats to dive and just take pen and paper measurements underwater. I wanted to understand how they brought mapping software to scientists who, at the end of the day, don't really care about maps and just want to understand coral reefs better. Before we get started, though, I want to thank the sponsor of today's episode as they help me grow and improve the podcast. This episode is once again sponsored by the Radiant Earth Foundation. They help machine learning practitioners in Earth observation by providing open geospatial data and models as well as have helped develop open standards like STACK, the Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog, which mostly helps to find geospatial data. They're currently still accepting nominations for the 2022 Radiant ML Hub Impact Award. So if you're doing anything related to agriculture in Africa, you can head to the link in the description to take a look. They've extended the deadline to the 15th of August, so there's still time to apply. This episode is also sponsored by Element84. They're a geospatial software engineering company, and they're mostly focused around large-scale impact projects. One of the examples of that is that they've helped bring the Sentinel-2 optical imagery onto the AWS Open Access platform, so it's quite easier to access now. I've actually had Dan Pallon, their co-founder and CEO, on the podcast at episode 16, where he talked about how him and his wife started the company and the division that they have for it. Again, I'll have links to all of that in the show notes. With all of that said, here's my conversation about mapping coral reef with Kim Fisher and Emily Darling. All right. Hey, Kim, Emily, I'm really excited to have you on. Um, Normally, I don't know if you know, I like starting these episodes uh, the same way every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. Uh, this is the first time I do it with two guests, so we're going to go, uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes, but I'm still going to start by asking the same question. So Emily, how about you? Like, how would you describe yourself? Sure. Um, I guess I am sometimes a, a misplaced and landlocked Canadian. Uh, I'm a tropical marine biologist. Um, I currently live on the Toronto Islands in Canada on a sailboat. So I think the water is always core to who I am. Um, I've been trained as a field biologist. So that means I'm happiest underwater on a coral reef with a scuba tank on my back, um, looking at the science of the health of coral reefs. And I'm currently the director of coral reef conservation at uh, the Wildlife Conservation so Society, where I work with amazing scientists and conservationists and policymakers and communications experts and software engineers um, all over the world. So I really love what I do. Uh, and thank you so much for having us on the podcast. I'll come back to a bunch of stuff, but uh, Kim, if you want to go answer, answer the same question. There's a lot to unpack there. Thanks for having us, my team. Um, I am a, my business card says spatial analyst and developer. And I'm a little bit of a fish out of the water organizationally because I am a developer and a spatial analyst. So I, that's, I, that's always like both things are core to sort of what I do uh, also at the Wildlife Conservation Society. But I have worked there for 15 years and have picked up quite a lot of 
conservation science knowledge. So partnerships like the one with Emily are core to what I do. So yeah, let's let's go a little bit into how did you guys end up working together? Because like just hearing the two of you there, it's not really there doesn't seem to be at first like a lot of overlap well emily you did mention like you work with software engineers um but like yeah can you tell me a little bit the story of how you guys ended up working together <laughs> i think i kim i might have microsoft excel to thank for meeting us <laughs> and the the pain of working in excel files for my entire career so as a as a graduate student um as a postdoctoral researcher and then as a conservation scientist I've always been really um, keen on measuring our impact. So is what we're doing working? Are we saving coral reefs? Are we working in the right places? What are the impacts of climate change? What are the impacts of management? All those questions um, need data. They have data. And you really need to, to clean and compile and organize that data. So typically, that's always been done through spreadsheets, through Microsoft Excel. And so the trajectory of my work has been working on those questions at a global scale, which typically means bringing together a lot of other people's data, which then means a lot of other people's spreadsheets, <laughs> which are all in totally different formats, take years to clean and compile, take years to add on other covariates or data sets to you know, get that, that impact information all together. And so I remember calling Kim from a target in Bozeman, Montana, <laughs> in 2014 because um, my boss at the time said, uh, you know, we have this guy, Kim, who was also looking at a bunch of spreadsheets of WCS Coral Reef data and maybe should talk to him. So I had just been hired to bring together a central database of our coral reef science and our monitoring surveys to look at, you know, the global portfolio of coral reef conservation at the organization and I was starting to really question the decisions that had led me to that point in my life because I knew it was gonna involve a lot of spreadsheets and other people's data. So when I called Kim from a Target in Montana in between like an airport and meeting my friends, um, I it was really cool to finally meet someone else who had been also struggling with these challenges and, and brought the tools of software. <laughs> <laughs> to right. the table um, as as a real option to try to solve this problem. Yeah, that's something I, I, I wonder a lot about is it when you work in the world of um, conservation or like you, what you care about, Emily, is, is on, you know, coral reef and the science behind it and the impact, like managing data is not the core part of what you probably would imagine the job is about, <laughs> like, but it still seems like it's a huge part of it. So it, is that where, you know, you do need to bring in people who have that expertise so that you can focus on, on, on that aspect of your work? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in, a, in I think com uh, computer programming is increasingly a, a large part of being a scientist in the sense of data visualization and software coding. We're predominantly using R. So I code in R. Um, I do all my statistical analyses in R. I make maps in R. Used to have a lot more time to do that. I love it. Um, but, you know, there are limitations to, to that, specifically when we get into, like, relational databases or dynamic cloud native programming. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, increasingly scientists are, you know, really working with cutting edge tools, but there's just still such a gap into um, geospatial cloud native software engineering, as I have learned over the last several years. And what's great about Emily is that she she gets that, you know, um, I mean, the, the sort of origin story from my point of view was that boss that she was talking about coming down because we were in the same building at the time, coming down to my office and coming by and saying, uh, we really need to do something about our coral reef data <laughs> because uh, somebody, I think in, in Papua New Guinea, had just dropped their laptop into the ocean and lost like years worth of data because it wasn't backed up. It was just files, Excel files sitting on a hard drive. Um, and so that brought it home of like why thinking about how you collect and manage and visualize data matters, even though as a conservation organization, that is not our core mission, right? We're trying to 
protect wildlife in wild places across the world. But to do that, you really, really need data. And and so the, the marine program in particular, and especially right, Emily, Emily happened to come at the right time because there was a, there was kind of a approximate need that was made felt at, at, by the organization. Can you develop a little bit on that? What, what, what do you mean by that? Like, what, what well, was the laptop went in the bit? drink. Right. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I mean, so I mean, to, to expand on what Emily was saying, like, we're, you know, WCS is our bread and butter is um, uh, people in the field collecting data like going out and so I think probably a lot of your listeners are are sort of are very used to dealing with remotely sensed data and 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 spatial data generally but things that are passed around between computers and um, we're kind of at the at the at that raw data collection it's the opposite of remote sensing it is very personal sensing um, and it's expensive and and we invest a lot in it and and so taking that data from that kind of raw, you know, point where somebody's actually swimming through the water and looking and counting and identifying at the species level what is there, how, how healthy is it, you know, is it bleached? Um, and then and then sort of marrying that with modern, you know, cloud native geospatial aware pipelines. That's the That's the dream. <laughs> But this is what I was really excited to talk to you guys about um, and, and why it's kind of pretty cool to have both of you is, is that a, a, a lot of what, like when I'm, I'm focused more on the computer science side and, and, but we care about the impact a lot. Like that's one of the most interesting things about people working in the field of um, earth observation and, and geospatial stuff in, in a lot of use cases is that people really care about the impact. You were talking about that, Emily, earlier about wanting to to protect the environment things like that but we don't we we get sometimes stuck a little bit in a bubble of like oh this tool is the greatest tool ever to do that and and but we see it more than a tool about like it's the whole solution but what what i find really interesting and what i'd like to hear a little bit more about you is how that really just is a tool and so you have from what i understand scientists who are going there who know the environments, we're going to talk coral reef uh, in a moment, who know that and then probably need some convincing as well that these tools are going to help them and they're not just like fancy computer stuff. Uh, I can imagine there's both of those worlds that are kind of clashing about like, we really need to have like a better database and blah, 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 blah. And then sure, but the, how does that help us get better at doing conservation? Mm -hmm. For sure. I mean, when we're thinking about conservation on the ground next to a reef, um, we're really thinking about uh, who we're working with. And so conservation is, of course, about people. Uh, it's not, you know, about convincing corals to do something differently or the fish to swim somewhere else. You know, it's about working with local communities, local rights holders, indigenous peoples, national governments, international decision makers on, you know, how do we change how do we change the system um, to allow nature uh, to survive? Because that's sort of the climate crisis we're in at the moment. But back to being on the ground as a, in a you know coral reef conservation program, we're you know really working closely with local partners on what are the most sustainable ways to manage coral reef fisheries. What are the best opportunities to sustainably finance long-term conservation and management? actions that are expensive. Um, you need to, you know, uh, pay rangers or buy fuel or have, you know, interactive educational and communicational communication opportunities like these things take money. So where does that financing come from? Um, and how can that really be directed at ensuring that communities have benefits from this work? So, so much of it involves involves people um, and where the coral reef data comes in is asking a few questions. One is, is all this work we're doing around community meetings and blue carbon pipelines into sustainable financing or sustainable fisheries management, uh, is it making a difference? Um, is, it, is it working? Is this a success story that we can, you know, scale up and talk about on a grander, on a broader scale to inspire bigger action? Um, and, you know, are we working in the right places? So one of the main 
focuses of my work is climate refuges. So these are cool spots in the ocean where coral reefs will have the best chance to survive climate change. And so our you know, theory of change is that we first start by identifying and working in climate refuges as you know, key priorities for biodiversity, for, you know, for strongholds of biodiversity. And then we identify, well, what are the top pressures facing those refuges? Uh, is it you know, unsustainable or destructive fishing? Is it water pollution from you know, mismanaged watersheds upstream? And, and what are the opportunities to fix those pressures, make them more sustainable, um, really mainstreaming that work into better outcomes for communities. So whether that's through food security, through nutrition, through improved water quality for human health. Um, so it's all becomes pretty complex and integrated and holistic, but I think that is how we're going to find these and, and really have these effective, enduring, uh, and ethical solutions for conservation. So data is a really crucial part of is it working and where are we working, um, but it's, it's you know, really a, a, a thread that weaves through a much more complex um, process of, of holistic conservation. And, and I'll just say on the software side, the, the, the case that we make, that we concentrate on is to our users, to the people who are actually collecting data and working with local communities to make the, uh, the results of that data collection um, available. So, you know, in the software world, we <clears throat> try to be agile, right, to sort of have kind of rapidly iterate and kind of be user driven. And, um, and that, that dovetails very nicely with the conservation mission of the purpose of being agile in a software development world because if you can make the lives of the people who are collecting the data easier they can be agile by presenting the results of that to communities on the same day they collected it rather than like waiting several weeks or months or whatever the years <laughs> to go back and clean up all the mistakes in the spreadsheets and the in Denor you know, normalize everything and get it presentable. But Add all the formulas, link all yeah. the data, get your final numbers to to go. You Join know, make to a the shape file. For. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, Points and polygons. <laughs> I was curious, like, on on that. Um, <clears throat> I see it as like a, a, a symbiotic relationship between the the problem you're trying to solve um, and how you solve it. Have Have you found ways where like Kim you just mentioned how you know working agile expands beyond just the the software engineering aspect have you found like where you you start bringing like software engineering into wildlife conservation and wildlife conservation into software engineering have you found like things where they spill over in methods where when I'm going to talk about the, the, the software engineering. We're kind of used to talking in very abstract manners because, you know, if we're talking about testing, for example, or database relationships, things like that, it's in very abstract terms that we can then apply everywhere. But have you guys found situations where it's quite the opposite? Like you, you could learn from each other in ways that just were completely unexpected. I, I mean, well, I'll just say absolutely 100%. I mean, that's, that's what makes, that makes what, what makes my job so so rewarding um we had a long before in the before times long before the pandemic we had a a workshop in fiji where uh uh i intent attended as well as a uh, one of our um close development partners at spark geo um and it just it just kind of blew our minds right to see people actually using the software we did things like um had a uh, a race where two people were entering the same data one using uh, Excel and one using Mermaid, um, and Mermaid One, just saying, uh, and uh, and and to see people's reactions and how they were right. using it, and really kind of kind of getting close to like how are actually people actually using it, and that kind of testing. I mean, that's you know you can unit test all you like, but but actually seeing yeah. people like you know tab and return and type and select options and everything, and it was it was extremely reward yeah useful for for um, uh, sort of motivating us in terms of, as you say, spilling over uh, and also kind of making clear what we needed to do in a software way, like what, what testing means, you know, 
Um. Yeah, I remember a story. Kim and I were also working with our uh, Indonesian partners uh, in Bogor, and we were about to catch a. We need to catch a taxi to get through Jakarta traffic to get to an airport. So it was like very carefully choreographed over many hours. And I remember the taxi pulling up and like a relay baton being passed from my colleague Shinta, from you know her outstretched hand as I'm running to the cab and getting this USB stick, and it had. Um, hundreds of sites of monitoring data from the WCS Indonesia program that we were looking at um, putting together into, you know, what is the first national assessment of, of coral reefs, of coral reef biodiversity across the country. Uh, and it was all on this USB stick. And I clutched it in my hand as we got into the ta ca taxi and, you know, whipped away to the airport. And over the next few weeks, when I opened this USB file, it was a 40 megabyte Excel file with about 30 different tabs <laughs> interspersed with like charts and graphs and then just raw data, you know, raw numbers for thousands of rows. And every time I would try to open a tab, the whole thing would crash. And so oh, painstakingly over several weeks, I managed to like really gently open an Excel file, like navigate to one tab with data, like select all copy, copy, <laughs> paste it into another Excel file, and then the whole thing crashed. And so, you know, I had to extract about, you know, 17 different tabs within this 40 megabyte file this way. And uh, I was just like, how does Shinta do this? <laughs> like, this is so frustrating and so not, helping her do her job, which she is so exceptionally good at, of leading teams to understand, you know, the coral reef science and conservation in her country. And so that's where it really, you know, this this approach of we've got to do this differently and we can do this differently. Um, and it's been such a such a privilege working with Kim and our partners at Spark Geo um, who really understand that need and who want to develop a solution for users on the ground, whether it's from the Fiji workshop or for Shinta with her USB stick that always crashes, um, you know, and, and what is the software angle that's really going to work for them. Um, so it's it's really been a, a ground up software solution. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that um, the, the effort that it takes to convince people to um, change the that change their data flows. Um, is often not that hard, really, because um, um, uh, it, there's kind of this moment where if you um, like, if you make the the tabbing between the form fields on your web page, like in our case, as easy to use as it is in Excel, they're fine with that. I mean, it it, it works just as well. Um, uh, drop downs are pre-populated. There's none of the kind of messing around with autocompletes and whatnot. So that part is kind of nice. And then there's this kind of, the moment that they then connect to the data they've collected um, directly, not emailing shapefiles and CSVs and whatnot, but just collect, you know, directly uh, connected to the API, getting, uh, a, you know, a pre-formatted data frame of clean data. There's this, there's this kind of this moment of like, oh, <laughs> that's, that's why we're doing it this way. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah where your indicators are calculated and your functional groups are there and your trophic levels are pre-populated and it's all this, all these pieces you added and suddenly it's there in a clean, beautiful, flat Excel file. But for you to use was like the light bulb moment. Yeah, I'd like to take a step back. Like we've talked about Mermaid. Like let, let's take a step back. Like could, could you explain to me, um, e either one of you, what it is and then I'd like to go as to how it started. But let's first go on, on what at a high level what it is what are we talking about so uh mermaid is uh first and foremost a an application for uh collecting coral reef data data used in monitoring coral reefs which has there's several different ways of doing that uh both online and offline um uh in within a web app uh and then storing it securely whenever so it's offline but stored securely online and then um, tools for leveraging that data, including a an R library and um, API documentation for building other sorts of tools and, and apps. Um, and soon, uh, a covariate uh, library for pulling down 
data that is commonly needed for progressing against that primary data um, for use in different analyses. And a global dashboard where you can see, absolutely, yeah, and a, and a global dashboard where you can see um, the you know, high level summaries of the data you've collected and all the other data in the Mermaid um, database. So in terms of if you're looking at, I really need to know the status of coral reefs in, uh, in Melanesia, you can navigate into the global dashboard, see where surveys have happened, see who's collected those surveys and get in touch with them. Um, one of the key pieces of, of Mermaid as well is choosing how you share your data. So, uh, you know, data sharing is obviously really important uh, in a scientific community and particularly when you're working with local partners. So, for example, um, doing coral reef fish surveys in the Pacific is sort of like surveying someone's bank account in the sense that local communities own tenure over their coral reef resources. It's critically important in cultural practices, in local fisheries and food security. And so while monitoring those resources is really important, just the same way you want to know kind of how much money is in your bank account, sharing that publicly is just not appropriate. And so from the workshop in Fiji that Kim mentioned, we realized that a workaround was choosing how to share data within for, you know, for people involved in a project by the different ways they're surveying coral reefs. So if you're surveying fish, you can set that method to private because in the Pacific, it has to be private. That's the only thing that's really acceptable. Whereas if you're surveying coral cover or habitat complexity, some other key elements of how we think about and survey coral reef health, then that's okay to set as you know a public summary. So to be able to be uh, the summary data to be shown on the dashboard. So um, now, yeah, working with our users to understand how is data sharing acceptable has been a really right. a powerful part of this process um and you know finding those win-wins finding those solutions and can um again I, I i mentioned i was gonna ask like very simple questions like what is the what was the need like what was the reason for creating this platform like what what is the the problem that needed to be solved and and, and why is this the way to solve it so one of the only ways you can uh, measure the health of a coral reef is by being underwater and having your eyes on that reef. And as Kim mentioned, measuring uh, the size of fish, identifying them to species, measuring the types of different corals, measuring the complexity of a reef using a visual scale. You've got to have your eyes on the reef to do that. We've you know, seen incredible advances in satellite technology and remote sensing. Um, some of those are being applied to coral reefs, like our partners at the Allen Coral Atlas. They're doing amazing work um, providing the first global habitat maps of coral reefs. But there are limits to those satellites. They can only sweep the you know, top bits of the mm -hmm. ocean or get spectral in reflectance coming out of the water, but they can't count fish. It doesn't count live coral cover, and you certainly can't get at some of the more complex um, communities or food webs that are really critical to understanding the health of your coral reef. And you know, it's it's the impacts of climate change, or the you know future resilience to climate change, or, or sort of all those questions we talked about earlier. So being in the water is so crucial to do these coral reef monitoring surveys. Um, there are global standards of how we do these surveys developed over decades of of scientists being underwater from, from Jacques Cousteau to today. Um, that's how we survey coral reefs. And so the problem that Mermaid is trying to solve is that everybody enters their own data into their own Excel sheets for their own projects. And it's very difficult to bring those data sheets together or those you know slightly different surveying methods or slightly different Excel files together to, to tackle this global crisis of coral reef conservation, where we need to know at a global scale or certainly a regional scale, what is the health of coral reefs? Where are these climate refuges? Where are the best, most resilient, most, most functioning coral reefs? Where are opportunities to improve sustainable fisheries to deliver nutrition and, and you know, livelihoods for local communities? Those questions need data at a much larger scale than everybody's own Excel sheets can provide. And there's also such a time lag on that, as Kim mentioned. You know, it can take m weeks and months to clean up your little Excel file to be able to tell the results to the people you're working with or give a presentation to the government. 
So Mermaid really tries to tackle two problems. One is accelerating how fast you can use your coral reef data to, to make that, that change, to, to have that positive impact, and two, scaling up. Uh, to you know, to be able to join data together to look at this problem at a larger scale because climate change is a crisis at a global scale. So I just want to try to rephrase that to make sure I understand it correctly. Um, so basically, it's a lot of these um, observation are done by people going swimming and I'm guessing maybe even like pen and paper or whatever, but taking measurements like while they're there of what is going on because we don't really have a better method right now to just gather data about coral reef and fish and then bring that back putting that into an excel spreadsheet but then it stays local and what you're trying to do is get people to share that data within what's reasonable together like to have a sort of centralized area where that kind of data can live across different researchers across the world. Exactly. And we've been able to show that it's possible with Mermaid. So we currently have over 35,000 transects in shared on Mermaid from over 3,600 sites. This is across 27 countries. We have over uh, 1,200 registered users, I think, by now, over 184 projects. So it's possible. And I think one of the coolest things that we're showing is that the you know, there is a big chunk of the world's coral reefs out there that are still healthy. And when we think about the doom and gloom of the headlines, you know, it is certainly not rosy out there for coral reefs or, you know, the rest of the planet's ecosystems. But when we only hear about back-to-back -back bleaching that's killed half of the Great Barrier Reef or that coral reefs aren't going to survive past one and a half degrees Celsius, it's a little bit hopeless. And what we know from being in the water and from bringing these, you know, underwater observations together at this large scale is that coral reefs have more than a fighting chance. There are still a lot of very healthy and diverse and functioning reefs out there that need our help, that need people to come together at these local, regional, national scales to, uh, to, to make things better for them. <laughs> and so, you know, that's what I think that's the power of data. And bringing it together at this scale, it shows that there is still hope that we we can't give up, um, and that's you know that's a really important part of Mermaid's mission too. There's a there's, there's a, like a lot of things that come to mind. Like the first thing is, how do you get people to use something like that? Like there's one thing to be like, okay, we're gonna make this, but I'm sure there were attempts before. Like I without knowing anything, I'm pretty sure someone tried it before and it didn't take off. How do you get people to use something like that and get wider adoption within the community of people to say, we like, because it's a, it's a kind of a network effect, I'm guessing, where at first, if one person uses it, it's not really use, useful. But if everybody starts using it, for that new person who joins, the, the, the effects are pretty immediate. The, the usefulness is pretty immediate. So was that a challenge about like, okay, we're going to build this and, and getting adoption, especially like I'm guessing within the scientific community? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of, of uh, being user driven from, from day one. Um, uh, didn't touch a line of code until we had had several workshops trying to kind of figure out like what are the things that we can abstract out from the different ways that people do their surveys and what are the things that uh, we have to you know put off <laughs> uh, for down the road and and what are the things that um, um, that are that are just going to make their lives easier in general so um, the adoption came uh, when we concentrated on making the um, jobs that our field staff have to do uh, anyway easier. <laughs> so if we can, if we can, it's 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 sort of a consumer business model, really. Like it's 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 the incentives all come from their use of the of the uh, sort of collection platform. The kind of mirror side of that, um, and I think the argument that we make to donors is that. By doing that, we then are, you know, progressively building up this corpus of global data that is then able to kind of play on the same 
cloud native stage as these you know big remote sensing uh, geospatial pipeline sort of uh, uh, app platforms that that we that we know about but to be able to um, you know our sensors are people and there's lots of other sensors right and and to to kind of get at the questions that Emily's talking about you need all the sensors you need you need everything uh, you need these data streams coming in from different places and mermaid is focusing on the in the water sensors. Um. The one other piece of adoption is I think um, this was a tool that was asked for by the field. So I remember um, when I went to Fiji for the very first time, it's not what you imagine like when you're landing in Fiji on some beautiful island. I remember it was it was a little bit cold. It was winter. It was pouring rain. It was pitch black. I landed at night uh, in, into you know our adorable little Suva airport on a tiny little plane. And uh, Stacy Jupiter, uh, who is the WCS director of Fiji at the time, picked me up in her like, old kind of falling apart white pickup truck with like a WCS logo on the side. I remember I got in the truck and she looked at me and she said, the one thing I want is I want data in, clean data out. Okay, let's go. <laughs> like she started the car and drove. But we've been talking for a while about like, what is this database? What are we gonna do? Like all these big ideas. And she was like, I want one thing. I want data in, clean data out. So I think a huge part about this tool in particular is that um, we are responding to a need from the field. Very consumer driven, very user driven. This isn't something we're like, hey, this would be great. We should totally do this and people will use it. It was like, oh, this is the need from the field. How do we, uh, you know, how do we do this? And then it sounds like the main challenge was, was user experience, user interface, like UX, UI, and, and that iteration process of like, these are the people that we need to make it for. Let's put it in the, in, in their hands. Like Kim, you, you hinted at there's multiple versions coming out. I'm guessing this is something that you guys are constantly working on to try to make it better for that specific audience of, of people who are to who you want to be using that. Yeah, no, exactly. We're uh, kind of a, got a big new major version, version two that we're, we're, we're it's working on very hard right now. Um, should be, should be coming out later this year. Um, and on a kind of more, yeah, even daily level, uh, responding to like anytime anybody's confused about something or right. has a problem with something or can't do something, you know, we, we, it, it becomes a Trello card, <laughs> you know, we deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to get back to, to something you said earlier, Emily, about like it, it, the, the whole story, the whole narrative around, you know, coral reef are dying. Like half of the great barrier reef is, 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 is dying. And, it sounds like the data is there to tell that, that that's not the case. One of the things I'm, I'm really interested in is, is the power of, of like telling stories. Like people latch on to, to stories. They don't latch on to, you know, an Excel spreadsheet to go all the way. Uh, but even a graph, like even, there are very few graphs that, that stay in people's minds, but stories really do. And, um, is that something that you, you've thought about as well in, in, in the bigger picture about like you have all this data, there probably is a lot of things that you can tell from it. And how have you thought about that um, as a whole? Oh, that's a great, a great question. And um, yeah, absolutely. The power of storytelling is is crucial. Um, and, you know, as a scientist, I want to make sure that that stories are supported by hard data yeah. so that we're telling stories that when when we unpack those we can you know say oh well here's the survey from 2015 and now here's the survey in 2020 and the managed or the not managed areas and like here's why we're telling this story about you know um about uh, communities local you know harvesting of their fisheries in in fiji but here's the data that unpack that so as we think about storytelling you know into the the you know the the coming years uh, we're so lucky to be working with uh, with communications experts um, particularly I'm thinking of Haley Williams and the WCS communications team but who are just so like their their job and their talent is to take all all these detailed technical things that scientists like me are saying or engineers like Kim are saying and then you know find these threads of like oh this is new here's the story here's what we're going to say here's the lead here's the call to action here's the three important things 
um, and really package that. So we have a series of uh, communications campaigns um, that we're developing. One is specifically about the future for coral reefs. And it's around that there is a future for coral reefs if we do these things and if we act now. Um, and part of that is showing there are still healthy coral reefs around the world. There are still reefs that look like you're underwater on the pages of a National Geographic magazine. It is not all lost. Mm. It's, it's not all gone. And so um, I think in terms of storytelling, you know, as a scientist, understanding the role of that in, you know, winning hearts and minds is so crucial. And then knowing what you don't know. <laughs> so knowing when to bring on those communications and media experts to, to help work with you and help uh, really shape those stories. Um, and it lets, you know, me focus on the data under those stories to make sure that we're getting the stories right. Do you have examples of, of cases or stories that, that where you felt like that clicked with people or, or, or um, stakeholders, policymakers? Yeah, I mean, I think one story that I use a fair bit or think about a lot uh, in my in my day to day is one uh, one of the first times I saw these types of climate refuges. So I'd been living in Kenya for a while, uh, so on the coast of East Africa, which had been hit by a, a big bleaching event uh, in 1998, one of the first ones. It was this real call to action that like the climate crisis is bad for coral reefs happened in Kenya, a lot of corals died, and the coral reefs never really looked the same after. So instead of having these branching or plating corals, a lot of species diversity, there was like big, hunking, boulder corals. Only thing left, more or less. And I remember being out in the water learning to dive and learning to survey and just seeing these huge boulder corals. And then in the afternoon, I'd dry off and go work on Excel spreadsheets from you know, 20 years of data collected before that. And there are all these different species in this spreadsheets, mm. but they just weren't out there on the reef. And so I, you know, I, was always being, I, I was always feeling sort of this loss, like, oh, I'm, I'm a new grad student now. I'm never going to see these corals. They're only in spreadsheets. Um, this sucks. And we went to, I was lucky enough to be, t to be taken along to northern Mozambique. Um, so about a thousand kilometers further south down the coastline. And I remember falling off the boat backwards with a scuba tank on my back and just opening my eyes, you know, clearing the water out of your mask and seeing, seeing those corals from the spreadsheet. Like there they were in real life, as far as the eye could see, um, branching corals, plating corals, pink, purple, blue corals, little clouds of fish. It was just like, oh, here you are. And they were protected by in a in a climate shadow basically from by by madagascar so you had these big hot pools of, of water um, building across the indian ocean in 1998 they came across the indian ocean and slammed into uh, the coast of kenya which killed all those corals and here i was hidden in the shadow of madagascar so that water shunted north and it didn't reach the reefs i was on because i was i was behind behind Madagascar and uh, and there were those reefs. So I, I don't know if that's an example of a, of a good story, but it's a, an example of if you, can if you can describe to people the different types of reefs or what these different outcomes are of climate futures. And then of course, what that means for the 500 million people mm. around the world who depend on coral reefs every day, then I think that starts to make why we do what we do. And why these, you know, understand using this data and science to understand coral reef futures is so important, because coral reefs will not have the same future. There are a lot of different futures for all the coral reefs out there. Uh, it's going to be complicated and complex and nuanced, and data can help us really understand what reefs do we work with local partners to protect, to restore, or ultimately to transform if they're not going to be coral reefs in the future. You need you need kind of like WCS is is pretty great in in uh, bringing kind of three communities of practice together to tell those stories. One is the sorts of things that I mean that I do like making systems so that you have data that you can collect data and you can like actually work with something have something to work with. And then you have scientists who look at the data and say what you know what is this telling us? You know what 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 are the trends? What's happening? What, you know what's really happening like data driven uh and what should we do about it and then you have the uh communications folks like emily says 
um, then amplifying and uh, making that story visceral. So the story kind of gets like it's there's different stories at different levels, but but it kind of gets amplified and and echoed at in, in the different communities of practice and it's it's quite effective yeah I, 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 you do need some some empowering to be able to tell those stories and and, and a lot of tools and in, in, in the background to be able to, to to get there um but yeah no that i think those stories are pretty cool like that is sometimes i listen i i think back on like at podcast recordings i've done with people like a year ago and I try to remember, like, what is the thing I remember from that conversation a year ago? And a lot of the times it's it's that personal thing that people told about, you know, the story of the laptop falling in the water, for example, or things like that. That's what I think people remember. It's not, you know, there's 33% more of this or 37% less of that. Sure, that that is impactful. And you're like, wow, that's a big number. But, you know a few months down the line, that's not the thing that we remember and, and not the thing that we want to tell other people about. Um, and so, no, I, I, I think those stories are, are, are really cool. And I think then linking it to this is connected to people's livelihood. That is something I'm also curious to know, like, again, for a very simple question, how do, how is coral leaf reef? Sorry like important for people's livelihood like for me i'm like okay you need fish to to you know live off but how why is coral reef important on on the super naivest question possible maybe <laughs> <laughs> sure i i mean you know there's a lot of a lot of really good reasons why coral reefs are important I think first from the biodiversity angle is these are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on our planet. They are the underwater rainforests of the sea um, for being less than 1% of the ocean's surface. Uh, they have over a quarter of all ocean species. So just incredible jewels and gems of biodiversity in terms of all of the uh, crabs and cuttlefish and reef fish and barracuda and octopus and corals and soft corals and sponges and you can kind of go on that all live in these very eccentric ecosystems like when you splash you know down and and dive on a coral reef it's just like nowhere else I've ever been on the planet um, you know there's little damselfish coming up to you sort of and saying like excuse me this is my reef like go away and then there's you know the surgeon fish and angelfish just like motoring along their business and there's the snapping shrimp and you know there's this this architecture of of corals which are you know tiny upside down jellyfish with their little tentacles outstretched trying to get any food they can get from the from the water column and uh, so it's just these remarkable places of biodiversity of course, for people, there's also crucial uh, importances. So for more than 500 million people in the tropics, coral reefs are a source of food through fisheries and nutrition. Uh, they are a source of coastal protection. So healthy coral reefs will dampen uh, storms or tsunamis or sea level rise. Uh, coral reefs are often in in you know, puzzle pieces locked together with other critical ecosystems like seagrasses or mangroves, which also form that coastal protection. Um, of course, for cultural practices. So in talking about some of the reefs uh, I've been lucky enough to experience in the Pacific, uh, those are so tightly connected to the coastal communities who have um, stewarded them and managed them for millennia. Um, and that cultural role is so crucial. Um, so we've got food, fisheries, coastal protection, culture, um, as well as other local economies. So tourism, coral reef tourism is obviously a multi-billion dollar economy around the world um, and a really critical lifeline for people in coastal communities. So for so many reasons across biodiversity and people, coral reefs are important. And we also know that they are the canary in the coal mine of climate change. Um, they are on the, the front lines of an overheated, over acidic, <laughs> deoxygenated ocean, and they're showing those signs of stress. And it's a, a real warning sign to, to us as humanity on this planet that we are passing some critical ecological boundaries. 
And so, you know, that's, I think, why coral reefs are such an effective call to action as well. Um, there's so much to save. There's still time. And uh, if we can't save coral reefs, it's, you know, it, it doesn't give me a lot of hope for uh, saving the rest of the planet either. So let's not do that. Let's <laughs> actually save coral reefs. And that's why we need data to show that, like, look, this is what's happening you can put that in the hands of people. Like you mentioned, you guys were working with uh, policymakers as well. Like, what what's the work that's been done on that side? Like to to take it out maybe of the scientific community and and in the hands of the people who who maybe can change things like that. I'm 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 guessing like this is something where you can tell them like, look, this is why it's important. Look, this is the trend that's happening, and it's backed up by a lot of the data. Absolutely. Maybe I'll I'll take I'll take that one quickly, Kim. Yep. Um. So. And the international policy sphere for coral reefs, there's sort of three key uh, critical negotiations. There's the United Nations biodiversity negotiations, the United Nations climate negotiations, which we're all probably a little more familiar with uh, through around the UNFCCC, the big climate cops that happen every year. So there's biodiversity, there's climate, and there's also uh, the sustainable development goals. So uh, coral reefs and life underwater are, are locked in, in there as well. Um, so our specific work at, with WCS is mostly focused on the UN biodiversity negotiations, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, there are over 150 parties to that biodiversity conference that are expected to agree on a post-2020 global biodiversity framework for the next 10 years. So this is the next 10 years of biodiversity goals um, that you know all these different countries will agree to. And um, coral reef indicators are, you know, centered in those negotiations. So what those negotiations do is say we're going to, you know, as, as, as all these countries, they're going to track progress towards improving biodiversity goals. And so for coral reefs, that's improving the amount of living hard coral cover or the amount of fish on coral reefs, or uh, you know, reducing the amount of pollution on reefs. Those are some of the, the key types of, of monitoring indicators. And so countries need a way to be able to, to monitor those and track progress, and also be able to bring in different data sources. Um, oftentimes government, you know, environment agencies can do you know, some monitoring, but they can't monitor the whole country, but there's often a lot of university scientists or NGOs or other organizations who are out there measuring you know, different, different areas. And so being able to bring those data together to say, is our country meeting the biodiversity goals that we signed up for? That's really crucial. And so that's where, you know, Mermaid can really play a role in these policy spheres as well. You know, you're talking about telling stories. We, we make a lot of um, slides that are a combination of a, you know, a, a set of pictures or a picture or a set of pictures that, you know, maybe are pairing like what a healthy reef looks like with all the amazing yeah. uh, sort of life, the abundance that Emily was describing, with one that has been bleached out, destroyed, algae everywhere, um, and then and then put some numbers on, on top of it. Like so, so you're kind of connecting on both levels, right? And I think at the policy level, it's all about what should we do, right? And and we connect on those both those levels. One is that kind of that visceral, like like just look at it like this is yeah, we're, yeah. we we got to stop this uh and then and i think this is critical and this is where wcs shines uh here's the numbers to back that up this is why like all of these all the the sdgs all the indicators that emily was talking about they're all data driven as they should be so so you 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 have to have the data to be able to say that and if you can't produce it quickly and reliably uh and efficiently you can't you can't save the world yeah, one of the things I'm I'm more and more becoming aware of is that you can only kind of change the things that you can really measure. So in a way, if you can't really measure something, you can try a bunch of stuff. But we kind of end up trying to change the things that we can we can measure. I think we we want to see the feedback of the stuff that we're the, the actions that we're doing, and and so I I can imagine like being able to come up with like this is a measure now of what that change can lead to and what the impacts have been because you, you come up with a new data point of like it's not just like me that went diving and i can tell you it's like that it's like no no no, no. look we've measured it now and we can we can bring that up to the table 
Absolutely. I mean, some of our partners at Bloomberg Philanthropies, they all, you know, they always talk about, you know, Mike Bloomberg says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I think that is so core to the economy. If we think of stock markets and investment and portfolios and balancing risk, the way the world works. And we've got to bring up, you know, if we want to be able to manage a balanced portfolio of our planet's ecosystems through a very risky time. We've got to be able to measure it in order to be able to manage it. And just because we're a nonprofit conservation organization doesn't mean we can't do that. You know, like we can, you know, I think it's a really interesting way to think about it as like a, a, a planet portfolio that we need to manage. I, I really like that. I think that's a really interesting way to think about it for sure. I on, on, on like to come back to something we were seeing earlier um, and I guess it's a little bit related to that. I can't help my mind go to like, okay, we're sending people in like scuba diving and um, taking measurements. Is there, and, and you were, and we were talking about like a remote sensing, you know, doesn't really, can't really do much because it doesn't penetrate in the water uh, enough um, to be able to count fish. Like if, if I understood correctly, that was one of the problems. Is there any, like i want to use the word hope because that i'm you know i, I worked in remote sensing so I, I see the world like that but are, are there any like attempts projects things like that of of seeing like there's got to be another way um to to try to automate or scale up some of that measurement where it's not to the point where we are sending people um i was going to say to the ground but i mean quite literally it's not to the ground it's to the water um and yeah I'd be quite curious to, to, to know if there's uh, been any attempts like that. And I'm sure that comes with a lot of challenges and, and hear about that as well. There's a lot of attempts and it's happening very quickly and moving very fast. And that's one of the challenges is to try to keep up. And just to be clear, this the remote sensing uh, does a lot. Like, I mean, it, it as Emily says, like with the Allen Coral Atlas, we have a global map of, of uh, geomorphic and benthic cover. And it's, it's, it's ex extremely useful. Um, uh, but you have to marry that with other kinds of data. And that's where, that's where uh, Mermaid comes in. Um, collecting that kind of data, um, there are lots of efforts with ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, um, drones, um, with the idea that you know maybe it would cost less to have a drone go through the water taking pictures and then maybe uh, do... Uh, image classification to try to speed up the uh, identification of you know what's down there in terms of fish biomass and, and benthic cover, um, and and that's progressing rapidly and it's doing doing great, but it's still in its infancy, I would say, um, in terms of being practical in most of the places that we work. I mean, there's there's many places um, I think that that it works better but uh for many of the um, local communities that we work with around the world um it's it ends up being um less reliable and more expensive than just sending because you still have to have the fuel you still have to have the boats you still have to have the people yeah okay maybe they're not spending as much time in the water but marginal difference um but i think that that will you know in, that, that'll keep changing as as the years go by yeah, I think people people being in the water is crucial on so many levels. I mean, number one, it is going to maintain our consistent decadal data sets of this type of monitoring. So as we ask, how are coral reefs changing? Where are they changing less? Uh, where are they changing more? What does that mean for people? We need to look back in time at these 40-year data sets. And so, you know, we need to maintain the consistency of those methods going forward. Um, certainly looking for, you know, where are opportunities for technology to help improve and speed that up. Um, you know, photo quadrats, as Kim was mentioning, is something we've really seen become more common uh, in the last five, 10 years as, you know, GoPros or underwater cameras actually become affordable, um, that there's, you know, access to Wi-Fi and other broadband infrastructure to be able to upload photos to the cloud to do automated processing. And the key is really how do we bring that data back? So I think that's one of the roles of WCS and our partners is how do we bring that information back to communities to say, here's what the photo quadrats found, or here's what the monitoring found, or here's how um, here's what we found, and here's how that might impact your decision making. 
So one example, when we were, we've been in uh, Fiji working with communities on Ovalau Island um, who are asking, you know, how should we manage our reefs? Because uh, they've traditionally managed them with t closed areas called tambus. Um, so that protects sort of a, a bank of fish that people use in the face of a disaster. So in 2016, uh, Cyclone Winston, the largest cyclone ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere, made landfall on these islands. Uh, destroyed a lot of communities, resulted in a loss of life, people lost livelihoods, fishing boats, and so they, with nothing to eat and not, not a lot of clean water either, um, they opened up their tambus and so were able to, f to, to fish those fish to, uh, for, for food, to, you know, f feed themselves and survive this disaster. So we were back in these communities a few years later and communities were asking, um, should we close the tambus again? Like we know there's likely gonna be future cyclones or other disasters, should we close these now and, and allow them to rebuild for the next time? And so before Mermaid, um, we would have said, that's a great question. Let's go out and do surveys. Let's look at the reef. Um, we're going to take these, these, you know, paper and, and pencil, you know, survey sheets uh, back to the office in Suva. We're going to enter them into the computer. We're going to clean them up, analyze them, and we'll be back in a couple months. You're like, that's a great question. Hold that thought. <laughs> and with Mermaid, we are able to um, type, put that data in as soon as we came back off our dives. So sort of as the sun is setting, the data is going into Mermaid. And when we joined the community by the Kava Bowl that evening, we were able to say, okay, about half, you know, all of your reefs have pretty healthy coral cover. So it's a really good um, habitat there to rebuild fish. But, you know, m m half of the reefs uh, are below some critical fish thresholds that we think you can rebuild if you close these. And so you're able to have that conversation right away that evening around the Kava Bowl, and that's just so crucial. And so, you know, how do we not only get this comprehensive view of a coral reef from, you know, as Kim said, satellite and remote sensing is crucial. It has to be paired with these observations underwater. And how do we bring that back to communities and local decisions makers as fast as possible? And so that's what we've we've really found is some powerful stories um, from, from Mermaid. I was quite curious to understand a little bit better, um, kind of on more on the development side of the project. I, th I think I heard about Mermaid first because you guys worked with SparkGeo. Um, and so I was kind of curious to know a little bit more about how the project went and, and working with them as well. Cause, so they're more on the on the geospatial uh, consultancy side. Um, and yeah, to, to talk a little bit about how it was working with them. I continue to work with them every day. We love you, SparkGeo. Yeah, we love SparkGeo. <laughs> they're very close partners. We work with them on a daily basis. Um, and uh it's been, it's been, um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about it. Um, uh, it, that came about because, um, I had worked with Dustin at SparkGeo previously, um, and, um, on completely unrelated projects and had a really good experience. And, um, it just kind of made sense, the patterns that we used. Um, it's a, you know, post just enabled Postgres database, all AWS hosted, um, Django REST Framework API, um, kind of the toolbox that we had sort of been evolving over the years made a lot of sense for this. Um, geospatial where needed, but not in the way, you know, like it's not something that you only use in a GIS. Um, and yeah, I think I think we, we kind of um, started off on the right foot by kind of I mean, all the good software development practices, like, you know, clean separation, microservices, API driven, cloud native from day one, all that stuff. And so, like, uh, why was it needed for you to, to, to bring in people like that? Was it because, like, you wanted to have more of that expertise or compared to, sorry, compared to being able to do everything in-house? Um... I mean, WCS doesn't have any of those kinds. Of, I mean, and I can get fairly far but not all the way let's say and it's and it's a big job i mean it's not even even if uh, even if uh i think right now we have three devs pretty much more or less full-time working on it uh from more, more front-end stuff we're not doing so much on the back-end pieces but um 
but it's you know there's there's a fair bit of work that goes into it and and it's it's like we we strive i mean again we're a conservation organization our fundraising mechanisms our hr our you know everything is not directed towards software development so it makes sense to contract out a fair bit of that work uh, but it also makes sense to have people in house like me who can sort of act as a go between um you know sort of user requirements basically and and the uh, actual development i do a lot of the development myself as well but um but it's it's more of a kind of yeah oversight Right, so it's 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 right. That that's that's what I wanted to get at. It's it's and get a better understanding of is that the like it it, it would be uh, probably not the best allocation of resource <clears throat> for uh, the organization to get it more capacity on the software side, because yeah, it's probably easier to just work with a consultancy on that project or depends who you ask, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I go okay, back and right. forth on that, honestly. Yeah, I think in general, yes, I kind I, I think I do agree with that statement. In general, as an organization, it doesn't make sense. It's more a question than a statement, by the way. <laughs> I'm just curious to know. Yeah, no, it, but it's it, it's an interesting one because um, I, I, I see uh, the way this kind of, the work that we do at WCS generally, but in the uh, Coral Reef program specifically, um, as evolving, you know, with the world, like just again, just because we're a conservation nonprofit doesn't mean that we can just be grad students with pencil and paper, you know, uh, eating beans at night. And I mean, like we ha we have to like um, scale up and we have to modernize if we actually want to do something um, uh, with with the rest of the world, the way that data flows work, the way that. Uh, web application development works we kind of have to like get with the times so yeah in general i think it probably the way our model i think our model has been really good in the sense that i mean i am a developer and i do participate in the development um so i i you know on a daily basis fire up the local environment and figure out why something's not working and you know kind of uh push pull requests and that sort of thing um but i'm not like the you know only sort of line of i'm not on the front lines uh so much um well, well i would say you're on the front lines of of I, well, user yes, experience I am. Yes, at yes. wcs so yeah 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 so you know it, oftentimes i'll be talking to kim and you know that morning he'll have been on with indonesia really early trying to troubleshoot yeah. something or you know they had a question about how it works and then late that night you know you're on with the pacific or a fiji program you know similarly i'll be on with you know madagascar or whatever and being like that's a good question like let's loop kim in <laughs> so having someone who's you know so agile and so responsive and knows mermaid inside and out and understands the wcs user experience is crucial in this role i think you know i i just can't imagine like you know having consultants who are you know either working those hours or available that quickly or you know deeply caring about our user experience in, in in the same way that having you know that part of the team embedded in the organization in the core partners yeah i think you need both is really what it comes down to and and how much of each one i don't know we kind of go back and forth but but i think it really works to have both yeah that makes sense yeah to, to have that kind of heavy lifting maybe done more on the, the consultancy side but to be able to understand really well like how you bring that help to solve that problem like you, you, you probably do need to to be in yeah that makes a, that makes a lot of sense and i know a lot less about the the front end i'll just say like um that's that's an example of the kind of thing that i tend to like you know let's get the mock-ups let's get the specification right and then you guys, you know, it's clear what we need. You guys do that. But if, for, if, it's, a ma if it's a matter of how are users um, connecting via the R library that connects to the API directly, um, and you know, if some, you know, if, if we're not aggregating observations in the right way, uh, and I have to consult with Emily, like, oh, are we, you know, the things, the things that we consider independent observations or or not? Um, that that's something we keep going around about. Um, that's a good thing for me to do. And especially as we think as well, like how to add different, you know, new features into Mermaid. So for example, we're thinking about, you know, social Mermaid. So obviously, you know, this this link to community 
benefits to governance to management is so crucial. So, you know, what would a social mermaid, you know, whole module of the schema that kind of like lands in and needs to be connected to all the really crucial connections in the back end? How do we think about that? How do we develop that? How do we aggregate or, you know, what does that mean for how users use mermaid? that's so crucial. So having, you know, you can be able to think about that and, and really lead that at that that kind of engineering, software engineering level. Um, you know, also as we think about new features such as, you know, automated, automatically processing photo quadrats. So right now we have the ability for users to enter in their processed photos. So like I saw this many points of this coral or this many points of this algae, which is useful for analysis, but you know, what would it look like if our users actually were able to upload their photos directly on Mermaid and connect it to the Mermaid list of attributes and classify it and then bring their data right in, link it into their fish data or their management surveys and like have, you know, be able to tell stories about that or look at that kind of impact. Um, so all those really crucial big picture decisions um, is, is such an important role for, for the, the, you know, the kind of lead engineer on this as well. And, and having that within the organization, being able to be so embedded in how the organization works and, and what are we doing and what are our priorities is, is really valuable um, to me as sort of, you know, the more, um, I don't know what I do these days, but whatever I do, <laughs> more larger strategy of it all, I guess. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting point, as in like, it's not a one time and done project from from what i can tell it's it's more something that you guys are trying to like it's a living thing that gets better as 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 you go as well remember i told you on the first day emily like if we do this it's a web app it's never done we're constantly improving constantly fixing constantly enhancing i was like yeah 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 let's let's talk about that next week no problem <laughs> No, but I think that's, you know, I think that kind of agile software development is actually pretty suited to uh, an NGO environment. So, you know, Kim, I remember when we started, I had like $5,000 I'd like scavenge from the couch cushions. And we started drawing boxes and arrows schemas with you and Dustin and just like, okay, what, what is sites? Where are sample events? Where does management go? Where is this? And you're just like, whoa. But, you know, that, that, was, all, that was all we had. Um, but, you know, as we've been able to build some features and users are like, oh, I want that. And then, you know, build more features or build out different parts of the application, um, build out, you know, the user experience, then we're able to fundraise more on that. So I think it was a re no one ever wants to fund a database. No way, especially not like an expensive database. But, you know, if you can start small. At least not in conservation. Yeah, at least not in conservation. But if you start small and, you know, sort of say, OK, here's some building blocks. Here's what it does. OK, let's fundraise a bit more. Here's some more building blocks. Here's what it does. Then, you know, I think that's really well suited to um, to the an agile NGO environment as opposed to, you know, a really pre-cooked kind of startup or corporate setting where you probably have access to a lot more capital um but you're anyways we just didn't have access to any capital <laughs> so we've been doing what we can that's one thing i wanted to, to to touch on 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 the financing and um yeah the kind of economics of it in the in the back i feel like one of the things i'm, I'm getting more and more interested in is, is kind of following the money a little bit to try to understand the incentives um and and how things work i mean you you, you touched on a little bit and but so how did you convince people that, um, you know, there's traction, we need more money? Uh, it comes to the question of we need to measure if this is working. So, you know, funders from through a philanthropic business model, um, you know, make really critical investments at the right time into the right things to have an impact, to change the world, to make things better. And so part of that, you know, social contract is the people who they're funding showing that they are making the world better. This is having a positive impact. Here's what we're learning. Uh, and so it's that measurement piece that's so crucial. And I think that's what we've been able to show with Mermaid, that it is possible to show this, <clears throat> this impact. So, for example, um, in Fiji, part of our work is on holistic uh, watershed management. So that means thinking about forest conservation and restoration in critical watersheds upstream of these climate refuges for coral reefs. And so by working with 
landowners and agriculture and the government on you know clean on you know having cleaner water both for people to drink for health and sanitation and then ultimately that cleaner water um, improving you know water quality for coral reefs reducing coral disease they can get sick from dirty water just like people can um, you know that has led to a 13 percent increase in coral cover since the start of this project that's something we just never would have been able to say before I think we still have so much further to go in terms of impact evaluation. So, you know, we think of impact investment, investing, impact media, you know, we really need to take the next steps for impact conservation as well. Part of the way we're doing that is through global science. So using all of these underwater observations and developing some of the first global models of coral cover that, that you know, measure how much coral cover should be there without management. And then we have a counterfactual to compare to and say, okay, well, you know, here's how much coral cover there is because of the work we've been doing. And that difference can obviously be impact that you can measure and, and communicate. And we can ask, well, where are the bright spots? Where are the dark spots? And also where are the blind spots? So where are we not measuring this or where can we improve our measurement? Um, and obviously getting, you know, it sounds, sounds really simple, <laughs> but it's really hard because you need to bring in all these other geospatial layers about um, you know, temperature variability, extreme temperatures, oxygen, chlorophyll, uh, you know, carbonate, what else? We're looking at human pressures, we're looking at climate forecasts, we're looking at depth and habitat types. Like there's all these tricky layers you need to line up and you hope it's some, at the end of the day, you've got some version of truth for your coral cover. So some amount of predictive ability and we're showing that's possible. And so once we can, you know, make these global, layers and, and spatialize them for the world and then make them available to mermaid or make them available to you know to anyone who, who wants to use them that's where we can really drive forward our, our impact so in terms of how do we fund i mean mermaid we're a small organization we're about two and a half people kim <laughs> maybe two on a good day <laughs> or like you know and uh certainly under a million dollar annual budget um so we're small compared to global forest watch compared to global fishing watch like we're a small uh, bare bones operation, um, but we're able to show that this is this is what you need to measure impact, um, and we're really excited to see where Mermaid goes next. Yeah, and probably to grow like over time as well. I yes, please. <laughs> yes, no, definitely to grow. Yeah, no, to grow, but also just to be able to um, provide the benefits of Mermaid to more people. So you know, how do we make better training uh, resources available to people? How do we develop a regional, you know, trainer of trainers, a peer-to-peer -peer practice so that local field teams anywhere can use Mermaid? Um, that's you know, that's the goal. We have over sixty organizations currently in the database, um, but you know, we know that the majority of data is from WCS programs because that's who we've been able to work with so closely on this project. So how do we? Um, distribute those same types of resources to more people, to anyone, to be able to use this. And it also allows anyone to contribute to those types of global biodiversity targets. So, you know, I remember when I was a graduate student, I really wanted to hope that my data was going to help save the world. And I was certainly realistic enough to know that it wasn't. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think being able to, if I would have been able to connect my surveys in Kenya or in Mozambique to the global picture, to the regional picture of coral reefs, um, that that was how I could help make a difference. So we're really working with Mermaid as we come up to the International Coral Reef Society uh, meetings this summer um, on, you know, here's a tool for you as scientists to connect your work to the bigger picture. Uh, Kim, I think you wanted to say something earlier, but it's quite, quite a while ago. Uh, I think in terms of, I guess I was thinking about, um, you were asking about incentives. And, and I think one thing that, that organizations like WCS have been effective at in the last you know, decade or two is um, is advancing. Particularly, WCS's specialty is is being everything is science driven, uh, and and saying that we you know in order to measure impact, if you really want to do that, then you know I mean that's that's usually our fundraising ask is like we in order to uh, to measure progress or lack of progress on any particular conservation front, we need to be able to measure it, um, and donors have I think. Have, have imbibed that along, I guess, like I say, with the rest of the world. I mean, that's that's the way a lot of things, the, you know, the finance industry, um, health industry, whatever. Um, and so they require that 
from organizations like WCS. Like when they give us a grant, we have to be able to, um, you know, we have to be able to measure things. And how do you do that? Well, <laughs> you know, you need to put some some of that investment into the tools for collecting and managing and visualizing and reporting on data. And they get that. So I think that's been that's been the that's been the kind of the trend in in, in terms of incentives, I guess. I can imagine one of the things going for you as well is, is if I understand correctly, a lot of this is built kind of in the open on being open source and, and a lot of the data being shared. Um, that's a very simple way to show that things are actually getting done. Like the, the numbers you were sharing earlier, Emily, about like the number of people who are contributing, the number um, of data points that are there. Like if people can go and see them, I'm sure even, I mean, I don't know how the, the, the donations work, but I feel like that is something, you know, where individuals can, can see that, um, both who, who want to work on that, but who also probably want to contribute to, you know, financially in time and anything else. I feel like that aspect compared to um, <clears throat> private company startup would a lot of it isn't like that. It's it's kind of you go on the website, you kind of have to trust them, uh, what they say. You can probably show what you're doing, and I'm guessing that's a really powerful thing going your way as well. Yeah, we're we're very we try to do everything out in the open um, uh, from the code. Like all our repositories are public, and we invite PRs from anybody who wants to contribute. So that's one way to contribute. Uh, financially is obviously another way, um, and then the th we um, try to make it as uh, uh, as easy as possible to share your data. So you don't have to; you can make your data private. But uh, the default is um, at least some of it being public uh, uh, at this kind of summary level. The high level summaries, yeah. So it's not your raw data, but it's sort of like on average your coral cover, your fish biomass, where you did your surveys, and then most importantly, who to contact for your surveys. So, so I think, yeah, so, you know, code, data, and then ultimately uh, science. It's open, it's open science. Like when we, when we draw conclusions from that data and publish a paper about it or a report, um, you know, we, you know, in theory, you should be able to replicate it. And so how do you do that? Well, here's the code, here's the data, you know, which is surprisingly uncommon in the, in the, in the, in the in the science world so we're trying to embody that yeah well i think as we've seen such a push towards github being you know an incredible repository of code of reproducible you know science with uh, you know languages like r obviously being so crucial to that and the adoption of just how we do science today um you know that's where mermaid uh really seeks to to intersect as well so we have an r library where you can both ingest legacy data through the r through our functions as well as bring your data back down so access your data permissions based basically log into mermaid and then get your data directly into r you can combine multiple projects you can ask for raw data or various levels of aggregation and then as part of our r package we have a series of vignettes through markdown files which is just here's the code for how we did our baseline assessment across three different countries of coral reef health um, you know here's here's the graphs here's how we you know re we order the graphs here's how we color them here's how we do this like you know you can reproduce this and so that's what i'm really excited about going forward as well is that you know we've just seen such a, a revolution in in r and programming um for ecologists and you know i really want to say that see that take off across the entire world so that you know any scientist anywhere has the tools and resources to be able to do really good reproducible science and access the hive mind of stack overflow or you know anything on r and google um i don't you know working in excel is not fun when you've got your 40 megabyte thumb drives that crash every time you're trying to open it to do your like excel chart like that's just not fun and there's no reason to be doing that and so the question is you know how do we use tools like mermaid or like so many other amazing um open source data-driven initiatives out there to really build the capacity for data science skills 
um, and have that as just the way that we're doing things. And same with geospatial. You know, we how are we uh, making sure you know we've got people know how to use QGIS? It's free. Um, you know, to, to layer in things, to get answers, to points and polygons, to do whatever you crazy spatial people do. But you know, those are all tools that are available and um, you know can just really transform how we get these actionable insights um, from this really important data that people are collecting all over the world. I think there's a, a we're kind of at an inflection point in terms of you know we've been talking about all this uh, cloud native pipeline building and whatnot. Uh, but in terms of the people who actually, on a daily basis, produce reports or grant applications or um, make figures for, for papers and that sort of thing, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, you know, we, we, we at WCS put a lot of effort into uh, uh, capacity building, in which meant here's your RGIS license, here's what a shape file is, here's, what, here's an Excel, you know, you copy your attribute table, paste it into Excel, do some simple charts. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I think that's starting to evolve into, uh, you know, people getting powerful tools into people's hands. So maybe you're still using a desktop GIS, but now you're connecting directly to the API. You're not messing around with emailing shapefiles and all the rest of it. Or like Emily says, like you're firing up our studio and you're connecting directly to the API and getting a clean data frame and just hit, hitting the ground running. Um, so I think, I think like being able to kind of, meet people where they are and then and then like kind of like like provide a launching pad into a more kind of modern um, data science program i think that's i think in the next couple of years we're going to see like some big big shifts in the in conservation data science it's gonna it's gonna it's very exciting i was gonna ask like especially to you emily like if if having gone through that you you has, has led to you kind of shifting the mindset of how you approach you know, being a scientist and, and, and doing the work that you do, but using those tools directly. But it feels like, I mean, I've already got my answer that it, it, it totally has changed a, a lot of things. I, I'm still going to ask, like, if there's anything else that, that comes to mind, maybe on, on how if you think like the, these tools, but also this just mindset of thinking about it in, in this, you know, maybe a bit more computer science-y approach uh, is. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, you know, it's sort of painful. I remember like coding a relational database by hand. This would have been like 2012. <laughs> so not that like not that long ago, but we had like the fish data set of like 30 years of WCS Canyon data and then the benthic data set of like 30 years and they had never been joined together because uh Nyawira would do the benthic surveys and type in her own kind of the same site names but not the same as Tim who's doing the fish surveys who would definitely have his own site names. And but you'd have the same date and like the same country, they were literally on the same reef at the same time, like often using the same transect line. <laughs> and these two data sets had just never been like combined. And so, you know, they've published and found amazing insights on corals and climate change using the benthic data sets. And then amazing insights on fish and management using the fish data sets. But they'd never really been able to combine them before because of like the data problems, <laughs> like data management. And so I remember spending about like, three months painstakingly trying to match every single one and like developing our own coded key of like, oh, 124B, this must be this site. I'm going to give you a 124A so that we can like, oh, it's just, just embarrassing to talk about it <laughs> currently on a podcast. But, uh, you know, that no, with, with Mermaid or with R now, just knowing that I never have to do that again. Um, helps me sleep at night <laughs> and you know how do we make everyone in the world know who's working with messy data sets that they don't have to do that either it's like my personal mission <laughs> um, and it's it's hard because as you know as a computer you know software scientist programmer people like it's a tough learning curve it's like learning another language there can be a lot of um a lot of things to overcome, uh, particularly if you're a woman in coding or if you're, you know, a person of color in coding or you're in the global south in coding. Like there's so many things to overcome uh, in terms of learning that new language and really entering this new community of coders. Right. So how how do we take away those barriers? How do we you know, give that launching pad, like you said, Kim, to 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 people to be able to do that is is really something I hold close to my heart because it's just. I just saved 
me so much time and grief and everybody should have access to these tools too to be able to you know help save the things they care about faster and smoother and better i like rounding off these um these interviews uh with the same question as well like um just as i like to start them um i like asking people for for books and podcast recommendations um mostly these two because um they're they travel a lot through word of mouth more than um i think a lot of other things um i think that they're quite telling on on people so i I, I don't know if there's anything that comes to mind. It doesn't have to be, you know, related to anything we talked about. I'm just curious if there's, yeah, anything that you've um, read or, or listened to recently that you think might be worth sharing. Oh, man. All right. Well, this is definitely in the theme of like nothing we've talked about, but maybe gives you some insight into my mind. Um, I have been listening to, I, I mean, I love Esther Perel podcasts in terms of like, how do we navigate conflict and personalities and relationships just like so crucial when you're trying to like take a software uh program through an organization i'm just gonna put that out there no um i've been listening to a podcast called burnout <laughs> that gives you another sense of how things are going but um you know i really love um we can do hard things with glennon doyle and abby wambach just like like i just love podcasts on how people tell stories relate to the world and stay inspired and stay hopeful um and i also discovered one recently lately called the song exploder which is also like super fun and you should check it out if you haven't heard it as well as minds behind maps i hear that's like an amazing podcast <laughs> yeah that one i've heard of i i kind of a bit ashamed to say the other ones i haven't i'll put everything in the show notes by the way for the people listening i always do that i don't have much to contribute in that regard i um i i you got like an entire bookshelf behind you kim i do i do those are all well okay so um it's not, it's not podcasts but uh wgxc radio uh in upstate new york uh is a community-run uh, public radio station that has a lot of great um shows and, and and podcasts that come out of it but in particular um it's associated with a transmission arts uh center called wave farm um which my wife has been uh associated with and in fact has a piece called here goes radio uh here goes radio.com which uh is uh a diy satellite receiving station so it, it kind of all like we we have these kind of crossover um interests where she's like uh, she and her partner harry have been uh creating the hardware and the software for collecting their own goes weather data like from from the like raw like step of pointing a dish at the sky uh whereas i just like you know i go to noaa i go to nasa i go to earth engine whatever and i'm, I'm like it's, somebody else has done all that right but they're like they're like from from soup to nuts doing everything and so um i i listen to uh uh, not just in person, but uh, they have a sonified data stream, for example, that comes out of that because it's an arts-centered initiative. Yeah, I'll try to find that and put that in show notes as well. Um, come on, you guys don't have book recommendations, though? Okay, I do. I've been... I got it. What's the exact name of it? Uh, I really love book. I've been reading um, Data Feminism lately. So it's just about, like, what are all the biases and structural ways that data is created in our world that we don't even think about because it's just the way things are and so starting to like unpack that um through the lens through through like a feminist lens which is obviously so much more than gender but for me really speaks to a lot of the inequities between uh high income countries and low middle income countries and how does data intersect in that because uh, you know coral, the problem of coral reef conservation and, and data in conservation is is at that intersection you know why do we know that the great barrier reef is bleached you know back to back because it's in australia which has massive national monitoring programs and then you know the ability to bring those stories to abc or bbc or the new york times or washington post or whatever there's you know a lot of of power and politics there whereas you know why do we not know about these amazing reefs of hope in the solomon islands or what's happening in papua new guinea or you know the the terrifying you know effects of of famine and climate change in southwest madagascar where we're also working on coral reef conservation so i'm really fascinated by how do we 
how do we overcome all of that <laughs> you know in a world where where data and climate change and and justice is so connected um, so I've been really enjoying data feminism in addition to um, some great sci-fi graphic novels that Kim gave me for my birthday um one of the books I have behind me is Manahata, which is a whole other side of the of the work that I've done over the last decade, which is a uh, project that characterizes the historical ecology of New York City, i.e. what was here before there was a city. Uh, I live in New York. Um, so uh, I and my colleague Eric, it, it's, Eric, it's a book by Eric Sanderson, and, and um, uh, I've helped him for many years digitize old maps and uh, try to glean whatever clues about the ecology of the place before the city um, that we could and uh, assemble that all into a, a book and a museum exhibition and a website. And anyway, so that's, that's, that's a book I'll recommend. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll, again, put all of that in the show notes for people listening. Thanks to both of you for taking some of your valuable time and, and spending it with me and, and telling me all about the work you're doing. This was great. I've learned like a ton of stuff about a field I know pretty much nothing about. So this has been incredible. Uh, th thanks a lot for the time and, and, and the energy as well. Um, I, I, yeah, great conversation. Thanks for having us. It was very enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you so much, Max. Much appreciated. And um, yeah, we look forward to taking you underwater either in real life or into the data. Sometimes. Oh, nice. I like that. That's a perfect way to end it. 